On this Marinations program, we bring you a song from the 2011 Planetary Dance as a taste of what you can experience at this year's event. This year, the 33rd Annual Planetary Dance will be held on Sunday, June 2nd on Mount Tamalpais. It starts at sunrise on the East Peak and then continues during the day, midday, at Santos Meadow. As Anna Halpern said, when enough people move together in a common pulse with a common purpose, an amazing force eventually takes over. This is a power that can renew, inspire, teach, create, and heal. I want to invite everyone to uh, make a, a big sigh with me just to wake up your voices this morning. Ah. One more time. Ah. Ah. Much better. So this is a song that um, Russell turned me on to. And the beginning is in Cherokee. And then I'll sing the, the translation in English. Wash your spirit clean. 
Wash your spirit clean. Wash your spirit clean. Wash your spirit clean. Marinations brings you now an interview with Len and Libby Traubman who uh, have done amazing work uh, for peace and dialogue with folks who used to be enemies. Hello, I'm Sharon skolnick Bagnoli, and uh, I'm continuing a conversation that, that we have started before with uh, the Troutmans, Libby and Lynn. I always like that you have the L and L, uh. you know, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, about uh, living room dialogues. Mm -hmm. Uh, a process and a group that you've mm -hmm. been doing for mm -hmm. for many years now, two decades. Correct. Um, so what is it that you would like to focus on right now about the living room dialogue? Lynn? Well, you had asked us a question earlier about circles and the yeah. how we meet. And there is an old way of meeting in auditoriums with a lecturer and an expert in front and people sitting one in back of the other looking mostly at the back of each other's heads. So in, in, in this new world, uh, just as the earth is round, we, we're experiencing that change, personal change and collective creativity starts in small circles. So the, the, just the, the arrangement of a circle is very important from, from a classroom to a family meeting in our living room, mm -hmm. which we had when our kids were growing up, to uh, any engagement among people, no matter how big the circle, uh, it's important to fashion a circle when bringing people together. Mm -hmm. Do you have rules? I think um, we were talking about um, the way the living room dialogue works. Are there rules that everyone has to hear before they come there? If someone comes in new, does anyone break the rules? If so, what happens to them and the group? Mm -hmm. As we said earlier, we don't usually bring in new people too often just because of what you said. It's really hard to have somebody come fresh who doesn't know the rules and tends to want to just dominate or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we do have to keep reminding ourselves and if somebody new comes in and occasionally we do have new people, we have to kind of review the agreements that we have made and it takes practice. And mm -hmm. even with us at home, after all the years of being married, we still have to practice and consciously mm -hmm. say, okay, I need to be quiet and I need to listen. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's not an easy thing, and our society is more chatty than it is listening to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So um, have you ever been, when you were in Israel, and you said you had been there, mm -hmm. did you go to the, the town that is um, Nativish? Nevi Shalom, Mohara Salam. Uh, we did not see them, but they f have come to our peacemakers' camps here. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, one of the women who was a communication uh, uh, a person there mm -hmm. has written a book, uh, yeah. an Israeli, called No More Enemies. Mm -hmm. And it really is part of the, the new literature, which talks about a, a post-enemy culture. I like the, that subtitle, it's not the people, it's the paradigm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're, we're moving into a world now where the new paradigm is that there is no individual uh, survival, mm -hmm. and it's the insight of Abraham that all is one and we just need to live as if we're one and neighbors forever. This is a very good book and typical of uh, the new literature that uh, confirms that. That kind of book, I mean, there it is in English. I presume it's been translated into Hebrew or is she uh, an Israeli and was written in Hebrew? It's on the web and I don't yeah. know if it's in another language or not. Yeah, I, I wondered if it gets over to where mm -hmm. Arabic people only speak Arabic, if some of these things, these. Mm -hmm these ideas that are in the forefront or on the edge or beyond their edges get to people that might be open to that. Or, I mean, I've been taught that, that uh, the children in um, Palestine are, are uh, taught to hate and fear Jews and that they do their, their arithmetic problems like, you know, how many Jews, if you killed seven Jews, how many, and, and they started out to be ten, how many Jews are left, you know, well, people say that about each other. The truth oh, is yeah. that people mirror each other mm -hmm. and, and, and live by our darkest stereotypes. 
But you asked a question about language and what we are experiencing mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, what, we, what we're doing now is being adopted, the, the model of the living room dialogue mm -hmm. in Ivory Coast, Cote, Cote d'Ivoire, and in uh, Nigeria, in uh, Uganda, in uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and many countries that, that speak French and other languages. So mm -hmm. um, all we can do is what we're doing here Right. and not be pre preoccupied with what people are not doing yet. I it's in process. Yeah, sounds like you are aware of the process and you're nurturing mm. the process. Do you have something that you can say about the role that food, sharing food, um, plays in these deeper dialogues? Food is uh, <laughs> really important, as I said before, it almost can be competitive between who does the best cooking. Uh, but it, interestingly, it we um, one of the suggestions when we were looking for another outreach activity mm -hmm. uh, was to do a cookbook. Mm -hmm. And Keep so we um, ended up putting together this cookbook, which was really fun mm -hmm. to do because not only does it have recipes for the table, it, it also has recipes for uh, how to live life, uh, how to listen, and it has lots and lots of pictures and stories about how, pe how the recipes in there were uh, taught from mm -hmm. granny to, you know, to their granddaughters, to their daughters, with little stories of uh, the right. relationship. And the fun thing was, in coming up with these recipes, people, we said, well, what's your favorite recipe? And then they'd give a name, and we'd say, okay, well, let's put it in the cookbook. Well, I don't have a recipe for it. We said, well, we can't just put in a pinch of this and a pinch of that. <laughs> so people had to go home and figure out the exact ingredients for all these different recipes. So it was uh, a fun project, and it got everybody involved. I like this. It's more than a cookbook. De definitely. A lot to read. Mm -hmm. um, how can people get one of these if they want to? They can uh, order it. Everything Just is on our website, and in fact, the whole book is downloadable from our website mm -hmm. if they want to just get some of the recipes. But if they want mm -hmm. the hard copy like that, mm -hmm. I think they're $10, and they can contact us and get them. Mm -hmm. okay. well, this, I think the cookbook is an example of what happens when people come together, whether it's on a campus mm -hmm. where there's bullying or uh, in a com community where people are separate or globally, uh, that once you come together and hear each other's stories, and as Libby said, see each other as equal and human, and begin to want the best for each other, something happens. And mm -hmm. it's a tremendous, uh, unprecedented release of creativity. And I think that the cookbook and uh, the films that we've made, and people just start solving problems together. So the relationships are, are as important as solving HIV AIDS. In fact, our colleague in Nigeria mm -hmm. has said that worse than HIV AIDS is HRV, Human Relationship Deficiency Virus, because it mm -hmm. prevents us from solving all of our other problems. So building relationships, whether it's at home in the family, at school, or on the planet, it's all one, and it's so important to start practicing uh, listening, and finding out what has meaning for the other person and thus dignifying both people. I think you ask what our hope would be for this year, 2013, or yeah. if we had new ideas. And I think it's just uh, what Lynn said is to keep widening the circles of dialogue. And that we can see from the experiences that we've had going into other communities, not Jewish, Arab communities, but just mm -hmm. cities uh, where people say that they feel that they're disconnected from each other, to go in mm -hmm. and have people begin by telling their personal narratives and making that human connection, and then sustaining those connections through monthly dialogue. And I could just see this activity, which has spread and has happened around the country where uh, often through religious institutions, a, a temple and a mosque will come together and share services, but just to keep this the rippling effects going of the value of listening, and and it, it'll end bullying, it'll end uh, people who feeling left out and disconnected, it'll help people, young people who are in high school and feel like they are misunderstood, being included. So I think that mm -hmm. just to keep expanding the circle 
So it's not only the, the Middle East, it's not only it's Jews and Arabs, it's old people, young mm -hmm. people, exactly. it's disabled and abled and mm -hmm. everybody. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, people can look at what, what they can do to, to focus in on what, whatever the problem is yes. and, and make a circle. Well, thank you so much. Uh, as you see, there are a lot more questions here that we didn't get to, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, I do appreciate your work, and I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. So thank you for coming to Marinations and um, sharing our nutritious stew of nature, culture, and ideas, which thank is what you. we do. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. And for what you do here. Thank you for watching. Long a favorite event in San Rafael, the Italian Street Painting Festival returns on June 29 and 30th as a benefit for the arts. Marinations remembers now the 2009 festival. These pictures were taken at San Rafael's June 2009 Italian Street Painting Festival. The festival brings the ephemeral art long practiced by the Madonari in Europe to bring delight to the eyes of some 60,000 visitors to our town. Good food and good music help draw folks and benefit the programs of a local nonprofit. More than 200 pieces of art are created each year by the local artists or teams of artists who fill the Mission and B Street Plaza with brightly colored chalk and pastel paintings inspired by the Renaissance painters, current events, and childhood fantasy. is supported by dozens of local artists and businesses and brings lots of folks to the downtown. It's a boon to the local eateries as well. Since the 16th century, Italian artists have painted on the street, hoping to get contributions from those who pass by. The vagabond artists were called Madonari since they often painted images of the Madonna on the plaza near a cathedral. The San Rafael Festival attracts professional street painters, local artists, amateurs, and children painting images that range in size from 6 foot to by 12 down to miniatures. Next summer, mark the second week of June on your calendar for an enjoyable Sunday afternoon excursion in San Rafael. My guest here is John Vasconcelos, former member of the state legislature. Uh, for over 38 years and he's going to be talking to us a little bit about politics of trust and how we get there. Welcome John. Thanks Bruce. Glad to be here. So John, your politics of trust is your big big focus these it's days. My, it's my life's work. Can you define that for us? Sure. Uh, we are, you know, we, we, we create the politics that we have and we create the lives that we have and when we create our lives and our politics they work off basic assumptions. And traditional American politics is based upon very cynical, negative, controlling vision of human nature. We're evil, dangerous, violent, need to be conditioned, controlled. So it's fascism in, in the extreme, but it's kind of commonplace in both parties, but more in one than the other, I think. 40 years ago, Willis Harmon, a major Marin figure, uh, wrote a paper called the new Copernican Revolution, and said there's a new thing happening in the world, like Copernicus and then Darwin and then Freud. He said there's a new emerging paradigm shift that not being not we're not inclined towards evil, we're inclined towards good. And it's Carl Rogers and Rollo May and Abraham mm -hmm. Maslow, right. Jim Bugenthal on authenticity, Sidney Gerard on transparency. And I studied with all those guys, and I had so much need to recover my early lost self, and figured out that there is a emerging, now it's 50-50 almost, that we're inclined towards good. We're inclined towards self-esteem, we deserve self-esteem, and our, our mission is self-actualization, that's Maslow's term. If we don't, don't live up to that, then we get the politics we have now. It's divisive, it's top-down, it's controlling, it's dull, it's dismal, it's dysfunctional, and it's time we outgrew it. Well, it's obviously a, us, it's the antidote, or as you call it, the vaccine. Yep. The vaccine against this sort of corrosive, uh, sort of Corrosi uh, cynicism yep. and divisive politics yep. that we've seen so much of 
and it's really alienated a lot of people. So part of what you're about is countering this alienation. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about what your methods are these days and what you, how you're implementing what you've learned over the years? Well, my methods come out of my 38 years in the legislature and my 38 years in therapy at the same time. Unusual combination, unusual perspective. I had more pain, more retardation, I had more recovery, and I, I went at it with a vengeance once I, I recognized it was there. Started to do talk therapy with a Jesuit psychologist who was Carl Rogers' protege. Went to a year where I did four, nine weekend workshops at Esalen or like places with May and Maslow and Bugenthal. I started doing body with breathing work by one of Stanley Kellman in Berkeley. Did 13 years with him. Put all that together and I'm, I'm who I am now. And I still do some every day. So that's, I shifted my sense of myself uh, to where I now work much more intuitively. And I really start with myself and my own being trustworthy as my template. Mm -hmm. And I keep deepening and I go deeper, I find more about my own goodness. In the capital, from that basis, I was authentic and transparent and, and, and invited people, including every major effort, I enlisted a leading Republican in my house to be a co-author, mm -hmm. lead co-author. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just me, the Democrat, the liberal, the touchy-feely guy. It was Vasconcellos and Pat Nolan on self-esteem. It was Vasconcellos and Lynn Doucher on aging. Vasconcellos and, and Peter Uberoff and Pete Wilson on economic development. And so we put, took the, the barriers down, and I lowered my own barriers within. I took the barriers down outside my relationships, and I was able to come to the table with me to figure out how do we address these problems. And we agreed that the violence is terrible, the economy is messed up, aging isn't being dealt with appropriately. And if you start with, do you share my sense of the problem? They say, well, of course I do. So, how, so you know, both, I think all of us humans have the same basic nature, inclinations and sense of things. And so we all would like to have peaceful world, good communities, good health, good education for our kids. That's common across all lines. Where well, the differences are in politics, they are the means we choose to get us from here, this dysfunctional state, to here where it comes together. And when you choose means, you choose means based upon the assumptions. So if Thomas Sowell of Stanford Hoover says, we're basically evil, then fear, guilt, shame, control, exclusion logically flow. And I say we're basically inclined towards good, so touch, acceptance, nurturance, self-esteem, self-actualization, those make sense. So you start from values. Start with visions, and then and the values that come attendant to visions. The visions, the values, and then you pick the means. Then you, then you, then you choose the means. And Einstein, uh, with all his brilliance, taught us that we can't solve problems using the same assumption that led to the creation in the first place. So if cynicism is the problem, then faithfulness is the solution. And Willis Harmon, my teacher I mentioned earlier, once said, in today's chaotic world of change, only idealism is pragmatic. Nothing <laughs> else can work. And that is... It, 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 That's counterintuitive it's for counterintuitive, many people. <laughs> but it's, for me now, it's, I know it. And the, more I, the more I go deeper in myself, the more I show myself more and transparent, the more people respond to me in like. So you think that there needs to be a cultural shift and it goes beyond the politicians. You think it needs to happen down at the community level. At the personal level. And what, are you, what are you doing there at the community level to try to make this happen? We're going to start with a series of in-home conversations. In-home conversations. Yeah, and probably facilitated by therapists who are of the same humanistic belief. And the first one will be in Santa Cruz. We have two volunteer therapists who are close friends of mine. One of them was my therapist. The other one was my best friend. And they're going to invite in like 30 people in the neighborhood and facilitate to talk. What's the politics of trust? What do we do with it? What do we mean? What does it mean for us? And and that's the first one. And just I said, driving here today, I thought I want to I want to call those groups something. I don't want to call them cells. I don't call them pods. The seed pods for the politics of trust. And have people come together and say, you're responsible for politics, because people get elected get elected by the people out here. And if we don't, if we aren't awake and conscious and whole, well, like people who aren't awake and conscious and whole. So it's a back and forth. Leaders, you know, get elected, but they come out of the people and they get up there and then they can get lost. And I get dead my times. But so we've got to change ourselves and then from that change everybody around us in every relationship. And it's, and it's just the politics come pace with the new economy, new demography, new consciousness. It's a whole evolutionary shift in culture. It's a lot to ask. It's a lot to ask, 
But what else is there to do? You know, you want to give up? Very important. You give up. You, Absolutely you, you resign not. Yourself. It's all, I can't help. That not, doesn't suit me. I'm inclined towards working and making things politics. I want a policy that works for everybody, not just for the wealthy few, yes. the privileged few, or the white, straight males. The rule. I want politics that really works, includes, welcomes, encourages, and nurtures every human being, no matter color, race, orientation. 80 years old, like I am, or 12, or my granddaughters are 22 and 18, been raised by parents who really give them self-esteem. They're profoundly social, you know, and, and, and remarkably, remarkably present, authentic. My older granddaughter is becoming a teacher for autistic children. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's got the patience and the lovingness, and the parents are just astonished by her presence because she'd been raised by parents who believed in her own goodness, and she's by and large lived up to that. So there's kind of two wor two worldviews. One of them says there's a fixed pot of wealth, and if you get some, I, I get less. Yeah. The other one, it sounds to me like you're in a different point of view here. You seem to be one of these people who thinks that we can make the whole pot of wealth bigger for all of us. Well, I can, but the question of what you define as wealth. If, if, if wealth is lots of money, th that pot is limited. Especially global warming, it's very limited now. But, but if you talk about wealth being well-being, well, yeah, that's the one that matters to me. Authenticity and uh, a life that's rich with friends and work that's meaningful—that's unlimited. And you know, think about how fast things have changed the last 30, 40 years. I mean, profoundly. And now we're going to educate a billion Chinese and a billion Indians who weren't educated 40 years ago. The world is only going to go going faster. And, it, and it, the war, the war, it, it goes faster, it gets chaotic. If you aren't stable in yourself. You up in, you're rocking the boat and you never get hold of things. That's right. So personal wholeness and stability is the beginning of a capacity to promote a new politics and live it and model it and show that it works. And I think I have an accomplishment I'm proud of. When I first ran for office, I voted against myself. I'm not worthy kid. And I lost. When I retired, the Chronicle, SF Chronicle, did a front page retirement story. Mark Simon, the reporter, who's a marvelous reporter, came in and interviewed me. He said, What's your proudest achievement in 38 years? I said, that I've not grown cynical. <laughs> that's said, an what? achievement. I Anybody said, who's been in politics that long, that's, that's amazing. Right. I'm not cynical. I'm deeply faithful about our own capacity to grab hold of our lives and redefine ourselves and each other's, give each other a different sense of possibility. That in itself is an amazing accomplishment. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased of that. You know, I'm, I'm pleased and proud of that, yeah. Thank you, John. You're welcome. I Thank do you. appreciate it. My Thank pleasure. you very much. Okay. Thank right. you. Now.